On January 7, 1953, in his final State of the Union address before Congress, President Harry S. Truman told the world the United States had successfully developed a hydrogen bomb. This was 14 days before the hero of our story was born. In this episode, I'm going to tell you how an NFL owner used technology to shock the world just like that H-bomb nicknamed Mike vaporized that tiny little piece of dirt in the Pacific Marshall Islands. And it all started with computers. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step up our DeLorean, the date is January 21st, 1953, and we are in Seattle, Washington, the birthplace of our hero. This time we're talking about Paul Gardner Allen, known as the Idea Man also more famously known as the co-founder of Microsoft. Now, his father was a librarian named Kenneth, and his mother was Edna Fay, who was a teacher. But at an early age, his father would take him to games at Husky Stadium, and he had a love for football. So it kind of started at a, you know, as a little tyke. But, of course, it kind of, you know, he didn't play a whole lot and all that kind of thing, and he'd go to a private school. It was Lakeside School for a high school, where he met, what would end up becoming a long-time friend. And we all know this guy. He went by the name of Bill Gates. So they had a shared interest in computing, and I think that's common knowledge. We all pretty much know that Bill Gates and Paul Allen are known for computers, but just in case you didn't, like I said, they're the co-founders of Microsoft. And yes, all of us, especially if you're listening to this podcast, have been touched by Microsoft at some point in time. But let's go back again. So, like I said, they were at Lakeside School together, and Paul Allen was a couple years older than Bill Gates, and there was an interview on the BBC channel where Bill Gates told of a story where he and Paul Allen hacked into the school system, and they tried to give an advantage to Bill Gates to try to meet uh, the other kind. They tried to get it so he was the only boy in an all-girls class, you know, gotta figure you up your odds. So, they had, at the uh, very beginning, a keen interest in the computing state and they used the school's teletype terminal which i don't even know what that means but it was probably very uh, archaic compared to what it is today but it helped set them on the right path it doesn't hurt that at the time when uh paul allen went to have a uh, a test to get into college he had a perfect sat score of 1600 then he went to washington state university But he ended up dropping out two years later to go work for Honeywell in Boston. And this is important because Honeywell in Boston was near Harvard. And this is where Bill Gates went to school. So they both, again, were in the same area. And it was Paul Allen who first came up with the name Microsoft. And he suggested to Gates that they work on this product together. You know, they had a basic language interpreter for the Altair 8800 computer that they wanted to work on. In fact, he convinced Gates to leave Harvard to start the company. Now, I don't know about you, but I've heard the name Paul Allen always. And of course, now I know, you know, after being in the NFL and everything, but the word Microsoft pops in my head, boom, Bill Gates, that's just what you think. But after doing this research, I'm realizing it was actually Paul Allen. He was the guy who had the cajones to be able to say, I have this great idea. Let's run with it. Now, Bill Gates was the doer, the the action guy, let's get things done. So together, they were a great team. But without Allen, it wouldn't have even been dreamt up. Bill Gates would have been in Harvard, you know, going to whatever he was going to do in his school, and he never would have became this muko juko billionaire and all. And uh, one way that Paul Allen did this to kind of set it on the right trajectory was in 1980, he won a deal to supply the operating system for IBM PCs. Now, this was a game changer. And it set the company, Microsoft, on the path to the stratosphere and beyond. But unfortunately, in 1983, Allen had to officially resign from Microsoft because this was the first time that he was diagnosed with cancer, which he would end up beating. He would bash that sucker down into remission, and then he would found a company called Vulcan, an investment firm that he used to fuel his philanthropy. Now, Allen discusses many of these things in his book that came out, which was called 
Idea Man, a memoir by the co-founder of Microsoft. And by the way, you can get this audiobook for free when you visit the show notes at thefootballhistorydude.com. All you have to do is sign up through my audiobooks.com affiliate link there on the site. Also, to subscribe for free to the show, make sure you mash that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes each and every week. But now it's back to story time. Hopping back on our DeLorean. We're going to February 2nd, 1996. In Seattle, this was a sad day. Because the current, at the time, owner of the Seattle Seahawks, Ken Baring, had an announcement that the NFL franchise that he purchased in 1988 was moving out of Seattle. He had plans of taking that team. In fact, everything was already there. And he was going to take them to Anaheim, California. They were going to become the Anaheim Seahawks. And February 4th, now there's some video footage of some moving trucks. And I'm telling you, it was like, it was just kind of like a protest type thing. You got these moving trucks where they said that they had the Seattle Seahawk equipment and gear and such. And they had them inside these trucks. And the truck was pulling out of the driveway, getting out of the road. And there was all these fans. They were like pushing the truck back, you know, kind of like the dude wrapping himself around a tree and that kind of thing. But it was for the team and they wanted to keep their franchise in Seattle. Gary Locke, the governor at the time, he explained how they took it to the courts. You know, they wanted to, I call it a, a stall tactic, and they wanted to keep the team there in Seattle. So they would look for a local owner to step up and take the reins. Here comes Paul Allen, you know, riding down the sky on his white horse, the savior, coming from nowhere in a press conference. So he decided he was going to help the team out. He was going to help the fans, help the city, help the state. In a press conference, he stated that, you know, it wasn't just about the money. He wanted to help the community. So he told everyone that he would put up his money, but at the same time, he needed their help to help build this stadium. There was a uh, a campaign ad video on TV in June of 1997 called the Referendum 48 Campaign. Now, basically, this is where he explained to the community that, you know, he's, he says, hey, I'm going to help you out. I'm willing to build this stadium, bring the team, keep it here, but I need your help. And I'm going to leave it up to the community and the citizens of this state to decide. Now, of course, you know, that probably means some more tax money to help build the stadium and such. So it it does have an impact in other ways. But he said, we're going to have a vote. June 17th was when the vote was going to happen. And it was close. I mean, they said that they were sweating bullets up and for a while there. And I bet Alan, if you looked like him, he was a you know, kind of a mountain man looking dude. So I'm sure his, his beard is getting a little wet. And it was up to the, the wee hours of the night, the witch hour, I guess you could say. And it was, like I said, not looking good. They had more votes on the no, or the no side for a while than they did the yes side. And it wasn't looking like they were going to have a stadium or a team stay in Seattle. And they were going to have to deal with their team going down in, to Anaheim, California. But at the last second, at the last minutes, the west side of the state of Washington, they voted yes. So you got to imagine how crazy that must have been to feel like you got your team back. You win. So Paul Allen, of course, a man of the people, he built the stadium with his family with the eyes of the fans in mind. The stadium in Seattle is very famous. I mean, for being one of the loudest venues in the nation. And one of the reasons because... Paul Allen built it like the Washington Husky Stadium that he went to as a boy. Again, with the fans in mind. He wanted everyone to be able to feel like they were part of it, this experience, the raw, pure energy of a football game. I mean, we all remember that Marshawn Lynch beast mode moment of the earthquake, beast quake that we talked about in the past, and it would not have happened if they didn't build the stadium that the way they did. And with that being said, it's not the stadium, it's the famous 12s. Yes, the 12th man, you know, on a football team in the, the stands. Seattle has that famous 12 where they raise that flag. And it was because of Paul Allen bringing them there. They said that when Paul Allen was the one raising the flag, the fans went crazy. They loved their owner so much and their savior for keeping that stadium, that team, that everything in their city, which we talk about a little bit later for what happens down the road. You all know what's coming up. But they just love this guy. So, of course, you know, after having the team for a little bit, he had to hire a uh, a proven coach. And that coach would be Mike Holmgren, who had a proven record already. But when he was with the Seahawks there at the beginning, it was <laughs> okay. But uh, I would say that the highlight was after the 2005 season, when he took the Seattle Seahawks to their first ever Super Bowl appearance. Now, of course, they would lose to the Steelers at Ford's Field 21-10. to 
but it was the beginning, the glimmer of hope. Again, never would have happened if Allen let that team walk away. Then probably the biggest move that he made as far as, let's say, the, the administrative duties as a general man, nah, not an owner, he would hire Pete Carroll to be his coach in 2010. Also, coupled with that, a wunderkind himself, Dan Snyder, would also be hired in 2010. That's the general manager, you know, the little chess master in the back. They just basically took this team, found the diamonds in the rough. I mean, we know the Richard Germans in the fifth round and the Legion of Boom and all that kind of thing. And together, they would turn the Seattle franchise into a perennial contender for the NFC West title. But then, after the 2013 season, they won the Super Bowl. Their first ever Super Bowl victory. And you got to believe that the crowds in the streets for that parade, they were going nuts, bananas, beating at us, crazy. And a lot of it had to do with just thanking Paul Allen for giving them that hope and being willing to just put the faith in the city and put them on his back to be able to keep the team in that city for the fans and, and everyone alike. But of course, you know, the following year they would lose the Super Bowl and one of the most memorable plays of all time against the Patriots, which i um, still not sure why they didn't hand it off to Beast Mode. And we talked about Beast Mode earlier and, of course, the uh, famous Beast Quake. But that play would never have happened if Allen let the team walk away from Seattle. Now, speaking of the Beast Mode run, watching that game would have been even more fun if you had some skin in the game on DraftKings. Which, by the way, you can get a free entry into a DraftKings tournament today by heading to the footballhistorydude.com slash DraftKings. Again, you can get your free entry into a DraftKings tournament by heading over to the footballhistorydude.com slash DraftKings. Now, he also owned the Portland Trailblazers and was a minority owner of the Seattle Sounders FC, you know, the professional soccer club there up in Seattle. Now, with all this, he never wanted or needed publicity, and he didn't want to be in the spotlight, but there were many reasons why he could have and did. Now, One of them, of course, is Forbes had Allen with a net worth as of 10318 of $20.3 billion, number 44, richest man in the world. Of course, I mean, he used this money for so many things and it personal and for the greater good, but I don't think most people, at least I didn't, realize how much of an impact this guy had on society as a whole. From a personal perspective, one of the cool things that I found is that he had a $200 million super yacht that was 414 feet that was called Octopus. Now, this thing was state-of-the-art, so it would cost $384,000 a week. Yeah, that's a week to operate. And on here, some of the features, it had two submarines, two helicopter pads, like 60 people or something to run the whole thing, and it was just super crazy, just basically its own little city on a boat. Something that was also cool was Apparently, the crew found a Japanese battleship and also loaned the yacht out for exploration ventures. For instance, one of them was to the Royal Navy when they were looking for something. But with all that being said, it was very cool. But he wasn't all about that. He was a philanthropist of unparalleled proportions. He gave away over his life more than $2 billion for 1,500 nonprofits and probably even more. Everything from wildlife conservation to a pop culture museum, just tons of stuff. He would invest in artificial intelligence, space exploration, human brain reverse engineering. He built the lo- the world's largest plane, but I mean, the list goes on and on. I just can't fathom how this guy had time to do all this stuff. He was even in his own band called the Underthinkers. It was said that he was inspired by Jimi Hendrix and of course many others, but His first concert that he went to back in 1969 was the famous Jimi Hendrix at the Seattle Center Coliseum. And he built this famous museum of pop culture, which now they have one in New York too, I think. But uh, just, I had to stop researching Paul Allen's life because I just started to get, you know, the whole information overload kind of thing. But with that being said, unfortunately, you know, this, this great contributor to society passed away last week on October 15th, 2018. He died from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, it's hard to imagine how much one man can contribute in his life. He meant so much to the city of Seattle, Seahawks fans, the country, and basically all of humankind. In 2010, Paul Allen took the giving pledge to give away the majority of his wealth, citing his belief as such. 
Our net worth is ultimately defined not by dollars, but rather by how well we serve others. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude, and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets about one of the most giving individuals in NFL history. Next week, we go back to the inaugural Hall of Fame class to learn about the record-setting fullback, Ernie Nevers. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads.